Welcome back to Books of the Book. We are studying the book of Acts. My name is Pastor Mark Howard. I'm here with my co-host and brother, Pastor Jim Howard. And Jim, the last time we were in the book of Acts, we were studying in chapter 19 That's right. about a, uh, well, several things in chapter 19, but we were looking at, actually we were in 18 and 19. We came into chapter 19, we were looking at a, at a rebaptism. Mm -hmm. And before we look at that again, we're going to just revisit that as we begin chapter 19. We're going to ask God to bless our time in the study of His Word. And I'm going to invite our viewers, if they would uh, bow their heads and pray with us now. Father in heaven, we do ask for the promised Holy Spirit to guide us into truth, to give us understanding in Your Word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we had seen in Acts chapter 19 that there were some believers in Ephesus that had never heard of the Holy Spirit. Mm. They had been baptized and when questioned by the Apostle Paul uh, into what they were baptized, they said they were baptized into John's baptism, that is John the Baptist, a baptism of repentance. In other words, to all the knowledge that they had, they knew they needed to repent of their sins and to live according to the will of God, but they hadn't come to an understanding of the knowledge of Jesus Christ right. as the way of salvation. And so Paul preached the gospel to them and they felt a need for rebaptism. And rebaptism is something that uh, maybe some of our viewers are unfamiliar with or maybe are familiar with but didn't realize there was a biblical precedent for that. Uh, rebaptism is one of those things where the Bible commands baptism, mm -hmm. but the Bible doesn't command rebaptism. Rebaptism is something that the Holy Spirit may lay on the heart of an individual that uh, in this particular case, for example, feels that they have come into a fuller understanding that they want to commit to through rebaptism. Mm -hmm. Now, when Paul rebaptized him, the Bible says here in Acts chapter 19 and verse, I'll start in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And now it says the, the uh, men were about 12 in all. We've seen this before, this idea of uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, we've seen different uh, ways that this has taken place. In this particular case, Paul lays hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. But that's not how it has happened in every case in the book of Acts. In this case, Paul lays hands on them and they prophesy and speak with tongues. That's not how it happens in every baptism situation or in every situation when the Holy Spirit comes upon individuals. Right. And so we see that, uh, as we have said before, some of these accounts in the book of Acts are descriptive rather than being prescriptive. In other words, they're not telling us how it has to happen, but how it did happen. That's right. And in this particular case, it tells us very little about what this looked like. And if we want to get a better picture, we would be better off going to different places in the book of Acts where it actually fleshes out what it looked like when, for example, they received the gift of tongues. And uh, so in this case, Paul lays hands on them, but that didn't happen every time. Yeah, in Acts chapter 2, for instance, we saw a very clear picture of the gift of tongues in which they uh, came from every nation under heaven and the apostles preached with the gift of tongues and they heard them speaking in their own language. It was very specific about the gift of tongues. Here, it's really not. It just says they spoke with tongues and we can only assume that the clearer passage is, uh, is the way that it, appear, it actually appeared here. So we let the clear passage inform the unclear when, we, when we're studying the Bible. That's exactly right. And that's an important point we've made before here that some people will take passages of Scripture that say what perhaps say things in a way that, that they, they, they want them to be or that goes along with a certain way of thinking, but that may not be consistent throughout Scripture. Right. And uh, furthermore, that may be a little sketchy. And if we have a passage that really isn't very descriptive and we have another passage that is more descriptive, we should always interpret the unclear passage by the clear passage and not the other way around. That's right. And so uh, as we carry on here in the book of Acts, uh, we, Paul moves past the baptism, the rebaptism here in verse 8, and it says, He went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning, persuading, concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years 
so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, one thing we see here, Jim, is what we looked at last time. The Apostle Paul isn't just spending a couple weeks mm -hmm. teaching. That's right. He's three months in the synagogue, and when he finds that, that he's not got a receptive audience, as this is very interesting to me because I've seen this as a minister. When you have an audience and, and part of your, your, your audience is just uh, not really open and resistant, and sometimes they even resort to making comments, they detract from the ones who really want to learn. Right. Well, Paul sees a need to withdraw after three months, and then he spends an additional two years, or it says this continued for two years. It may have included that three months, but the point is that he is here for, for this period of time. I think, in fact, if we look at this, he was here for longer than two years. The three months were in addition, and there was other, some, some other time in, in, in uh, reckoning that. And he taught during that whole period of time discipling these new believers. That's right. That's right. Well, if you pick up in verse 11, there's some exciting things that begin to happen mm. uh, here in, uh, in Ephesus. It says in verse 11, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, we see this, in the, the closest we can probably see something like this in the life of Jesus was when the woman with the flow of blood, um, she needed it healed and she couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. And so she just reached out and touched the hem of his garment. And just from the hem of his garment, virtue came out from Jesus and, and, and brought healing to her. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's danger in looking at this and seeing aprons and handkerchiefs and thinking that there's some... As if there's power in a relic. Power in a relic or something like that, exactly. Um, anytime there was faith, or anytime there was healing, regardless of, of how it came, whether it was through things like this or, or without, there was always a couple of clear characteristics. There was always divine power and there was always faith by the one who was being healed. Or, or the ones, if, at a minimum, who were bringing the person to be That's healed. right, and faith in the person of Jesus Christ, not in a, an article of, That's of right. some magic charm. That's right, excellent. And uh, yet, it, when we talk about this, we're going to see that um, faith is the important element that some people don't understand, and those that we're about to, <laughs> to read yes. about didn't seem to understand it. If you keep reading in verse 13, it says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So these were some who were going around trying to uh, mimic what the Apostle Paul was doing in calling evil spirits out. And so they speak and say, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Mm. And it says also there were seven sons of Siva, a, a Jewish chief priest who did so. Now, you get a picture here that they're seeing this incredible power and they're thinking, hey, maybe we can, you know, get the benefit of this power. They wanted to use this power. And, you know, it <laughs> it's, brings to memory a, a guy named Elemis. Yes, exactly. We had a sorcerer who was doing that previously. And uh, we have examples like Simon trying to buy the Holy Spirit. That's right. Uh, we have Ananias and Sapphira who were wanting the benefits of the common pool uh, without having the sacrifice and commitment of actually surrendering the full cost back in chapter 5 when we studied that of their land that they had sold. So we, we recognize from this a couple of things. First, they wanted the benefits of the church without the commitment. And you can't have the benefits of the gospel without the commitment and the surrender to Christ. And secondly, they wanted to use the Spirit instead of being used by the Spirit. That's right. And we've got to understand that the Spirit is not a tool that, that we, you know, wield, but it's, the Holy Spirit is a power, the power of God is God Himself who wants to use us, and we need to go as the Spirit directs, and that's not exactly how this was. I'm, I'm sure that the sons of Siva who were here, you know, wanting to cast out the, the Spirit, um, if the Spirit of God would actually have given them the power to do that, I'm sure that they would have been happy about that. But then if the Spirit of God would have told them to go, as Paul did, into a town where they would be dragged out and stoned, they probably wouldn't have done That's that. Right. 
And that's the difference. See, we can't choo- pick and choose where God will use us. We need to be willing to go where God will lead us. Absolutely. And so as a result, they didn't have much success. It says in uh, verse 15, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Mm. And, and the, the Greek in this says, Jesus I know, meaning, and, and the word for, uh, for know is different for, between Jesus I know and Paul I know. It's Jesus I know, meaning I know uh, the authority. I, re- I acknowledge and recognize the authority. Paul I know in a sort of acquaintance way, or I'm familiar with right. Paul. And then literally it's, but you, who are you? So you get this picture that if it were Paul who were claiming the name of Jesus, the Spirit would have responded differently. But just like Jesus could tell the difference between someone who had faith and someone who was without faith but was just trying to, um, to, to use uh, the gospel in some way for their own benefit, in the same way, this spirit, evil spirit here can clearly see that there's a difference. There's no real power here. The Spirit knows that there is no power when there's no faith. And I go back to that story of the woman with the flow of blood and how all those people were pressing up against Jesus when she reached and touched his garment. And they didn't receive the virtue and power that came from Jesus, but her faith made it effective. And she was able to receive the power of Jesus because of that faith. The sons of Siva didn't have that faith. They thought that they could have the benefits of the gospel without having that type of living, active faith. And as a result, they were very embarrassed because in verse 16 it says, Then the man in whom the evil spirit was was, leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded and very embarrassed, I'm sure. Wow, amazing. And uh, this is, there's a lot in this. In fact, uh, the first thing that grabs my attention is Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? The devil doesn't even know the people. In other words, these are people who are not committed to the Lord. That's right. And, and Jesus said there are only two masters. You're either serving one or the other. If they're not serving the Lord, they're serving the other master. And the other master doesn't even know their names of wow. his own servants. But he sure knows the name of the Lord's servants. That's right. That's interesting. And then furthermore, these guys are using the name of Jesus like a good luck charm. Mm-hmm. They think they can just take the name of Jesus whenever it suits them, as you've touched on a little bit here. And I wonder to myself how many Christians use the name of Jesus as a good luck charm, uh, mm-hmm. something that gains us some kind of benefit. Um, I can't help but think about, uh, I had an experience once where my wife and I were looking to have some service done and we looked in the phone book and, and uh, there was a, an ad for a service contractor with a little fish symbol, which mm-hmm. is something that Christians use on a fairly regular basis advertisement they were Christian and the idea is I'm a Christian so I'm going to be honest and what have you well that just wasn't the case when we ended up you know but the person you know I had to think after the fact that this person wasn't much of a Christian why are they having this symbol because they figured if I put that in there I'm going to gain people confidence uh, confidence in people as they're going to think I'm an honest person Mm -hmm. they were using this particular business was using the name of Jesus to suit their own purposes so were these uh, itinerant exorcists and uh, we're going to see a little bit more about that, but we need to take a break. And when we come back from the break, we're going to come back to Acts chapter 19, and we're going to look at uh, uh, what the Bible goes on to say about this work in Ephesus. So stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Have you ever been driving when a sudden thunderstorm dropped rain that obscured your vision and you couldn't see the road ahead? What did you do? Most likely you turned on the windshield wipers to remove the pelting rain restore a clear view, and make it possible to continue your trip confidently. I compare those windshield wipers to wisdom. Life's journey can become pretty unclear without it. As a youth, I admired my father's interaction with others. He had wisdom that he had asked for and received from God. In James 1.5 it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to you. I began at an early age to earnestly pray for this great gift, and as I matured, I recognized there were two kinds of wisdom. One is worldly, and the other is heavenly. 
In James 3.17, it says, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's the uncommon wisdom I ask for daily. So pray daily for a dose of God's wisdom and watch how the Holy Spirit turns on the wipers to clear your mind and guide you to walk in the footsteps of Christ. Welcome back to Books of the Book. And when we went to our break, Mark, we were taking our, uh, our path through Acts chapter 19 and looking at the different things that were happening here in Ephesus. And we talked about this uh, this effort by these itinerant Jewish exorcists to use the name of Jesus as a good luck charm. And we learned that, you know, you can't use the name of Jesus without having faith in Jesus. The name of Jesus without having faith in Jesus is powerless, and they learned that. And, uh, you know, we need to recognize that too, that the name of Jesus, the name of Christian or, or our profession is powerless without a living, active faith in Christ where we have a genuine experience with Him, where we're spending time with Him, where we have a relationship with Him. So having said that, we see that there was uh, a, a, a response that happened here in Ephesus as a result of this. And why don't you take us to that beginning in verse 17. Well, you know, you read actually in verse 16 how the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, and they fled out of the house naked and wounded. That's right. So, and this is all seven of these young guys. And so it says in verse 17, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Mm. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. And there's a lot happening here. Yes. The name of Jesus was magnified. Before they were using, they were name dropping. They figured we'll just use the name of Jesus and we'll, we'll uh, call ourselves Christians or we'll, we'll cast out demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. But when this e event took place, people learned that the name of Jesus is not a name to play around with. Mm. That this is something that is serious. Don't take the name unless you have faith in the name. Mm. And so what began happening, notice in verse, uh, again, I'll read verse 18. Many who, notice, had believed. This isn't the unbelievers. Many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Now you would say, well, if they had believed, haven't they already confessed their deeds? Right. But what's, what we see happening here is when they saw this, this uh, experience with these seven sons of Siva, they realized some of them probably had believed, but had maybe not made a full commitment to the Lord or, or come clean on certain things and they were playing around with the name. And when they realized the name of Jesus is nothing to play around with and the great fear fell on them all, and the name of Jesus was magnified. Those who believed came and began confessing and telling their deeds and, and coming clean with That's the right. Lord. And so you have a revival taking place. And notice something interesting that happens in the context of this revival. Verse 19 says, Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Wow. Now, there's a few things here that we need to look at. Uh, Ephesus was a place where magic was prominent. This is one of the reasons why the, why the Lord worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul to counteract the magic influence in Ephesus. And, uh, you know, we're not going to take the time to go into the Old Testament and look at the many places where the Lord spoke very clearly and pointedly against the magic arts. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for some people today, it's, it, they, they, they don't realize the link to the supernatural being basically the power of the devil and his angels. Right. not some other good power and white magic and black magic that some people speak of. It's all the power of the enemy if it's not the power of God. And so these believers, for whatever reason, who had, had been involved in, in magic, had their books of magic that they had not gotten rid of. And when this situation took place with these exorcists mm -hmm. and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, they realize their need to get rid of every trace of these things in their lives that were militating against their experience with the Lord. Mm. 
And so it says they took them together and they had a, you know, they had a big sale and they auctioned them off because they totaled <laughs> 50,000 pieces of silver. Just to give our viewers an understanding, um, in, uh, a, a number of scholars understand this to probably refer to these pieces of silver as, as drachma, which are uh, equivalent to a day's wages. Mm -hmm. And if you figure that, 50,000 pieces would be equivalent of 137 years worth of wages for a working person. We're not talking about a little bit of money here. And there could have been a very great temptation to just sell off the magic books right. and, hey, give the money to the church, right? Yeah, right. But they didn't want any trace of this, uh, evil this, thing, this evil influence that had led them away from or into sin to be uh, influencing somebody else. And so they took them and they burned them. And I think there's a lesson here for us. There, you know, I'm, uh, I've been in pastoral ministry for about 13 plus years now. And there have been a number of times where I have visited with members, and I'm not trying to rat anybody out, but I've visited members in their home, and I'm surprised sometimes at the things they have, the media that they have mm. in their homes, and yet they claim to be Christians. Mm. Things that, that can't help but militate against their relationship with Jesus. And I think whether it be books or music or, or, or movies, sometimes it's relationships or other things that come into our lives, those things that influence us for evil, I think there is a need in the Christian church today for a burning of the magical books. Amen. And when they did that, when they put on this wholehearted commitment to the Lord, what happened? Well, verse 20 tells us the results. It says, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And you get this sense with this word so that because they made the commitment and the surrender as of a these result. things that were standing in the way, that it resulted in the word, of, almost as if the word of the Lord could not grow mightily there. The word of the Lord was being uh, prevented from growing in Ephesus until they made the, the surrender of those things that they knew in their heart were standing in the way. And I wonder if there's any of our viewers today who as you're watching this program, you're thinking, you know what? What Pastor Howard has just mentioned is something that I need in my life. I need to burn the magic books. And maybe you've been wondering why you've had an up and down experience. And from this program, you're thinking maybe it's because of that thing that the Lord Jesus has been putting his, his finger on in my heart, in my life, in my habits. And uh, maybe as you said, Mark, it's time for not only our viewers, but all of us to take a hard look at what we need to do to, to move those obstacles that are keeping the word of the Lord from growing mightily. And uh, I pray and hope that our viewers will take that challenge seriously and that we will too. That's right. I, I can't help but think of a, a, of a young church member I had many years back, uh, an 18 year old young man who had been convicted about some of the music he was listening to and its influence on his Christian experience. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the day, in fact, I had preached probably on burning these magical books. But he, this young man came to me after uh, that evening we had a service in our church. And he said, Pastor, he said, I went home today. And he said, I took that music and I got out a ball peen hammer and I just <laughs> whacked those CDs to pieces. And what he was telling me is he had burned those magical books. Right. And it, his spiritual life took off after that. And I just can't help but think about that. You know, it, 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 sometimes we fear to burn the magical books. That's right. We fear what we're going to lose, but we don't lose. We gain everything. That's right. And there's so many things, in, especially in media today, that are, that are evidently and inherently sinful. We know it, but for whatever reason, we've, it's, it's become commonplace. And, right. and so we fail to see the importance and, and, it, and it just blocks our life. And we just encourage you, those things that are preventing the purity of your faith, that, that we would take this counsel seriously and we would take out that ball peen hammer and we'd, <laughs> or we would get that lighter and we would just burn the magic books. That's right. Well, in verse 21, it says, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he went into Macedonia, uh, he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. Then it says, and about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. So there's a commotion stirring up here in Ephesus. 
for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the, with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only this, is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. The poor goddess Diana. Yeah, can't fend for herself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Here you see this picture of what's really happening is pretty clear. The prophets are, are beginning to go down right. uh, because they are responsible for, for making these things that uh, ultimately the people are worshiping. And as Paul's influence and the gospel's influence has come into Ephesus, fewer people are, are, are buying these relics and, and idols. And so you see this picture of, once again, just like when Paul healed the slave girl and we found that she, uh, she could no longer bring profit to the master, they got upset. The same thing happens here, and they're very upset, and it begins to create a, create a major problem in the city. That's right. It says in verse 29, the whole city, so the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the, into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians and Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go in to the people, the disciples would not allow him. And some of the officials in Asia who were his friends sent to him, pleading he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And most of them did not know why they had, uh, why they had come together. Now this is interesting to me, Jim, because this, we, we've seen the Jews stirring up the people. That's right. Now we have an, a, an event here where the Gentiles are stirring That's up right. the people. So it's not exclusive to the Jews. It's exclu exclusive to carnal humanity, right. we're, gonna, we're not going to tell the real reason. We're greedy or we're envious, and so we're going to stir people up. The people didn't even know they were there. You had a full-on mob mentality going on mm. and when they brought him into the temple, and they began to cry for two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians, mm. and just wanting the blood of these men. Yeah. And in verse uh, uh, 35, it continues on. Why don't you pick up there? Well, the city clerk must have been inspired by God because the city clerk is a voice of reason, and he quiets the crowd and says, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. He goes on to describe how, really, if you're going to have an assembly, then you should do it lawfully. Right. And if you've got charges, we have a process for that. And then at the close of it, he, in verse 41, it says, And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. <laughs> Amazing. This mob, how are, how are they going to get out of it? It seems impossible. And somehow the Lord intervenes and the mob is dispersed. And in verse 1 of chapter 20, Paul is headed off to Macedonia to yet another adventure. That's right. <laughs> Incredible adventure at, at Ephesus. Well, we're out of time for today, but we thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll join us again next time on Books of the Book.